Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar on nature and uh, my name is Nishu Kaul, and I work as the director at EarthDay.org. Uh, EarthDay.org, which was previously, as you will all know, it was called Earth Day Network, and we have been recently renamed. Uh, Earth, we are the organizers of Earth Day, which is celebrated every year on April 22, uh, since its inception in 1970. Uh, and we engage with over uh, 50,000 organizations globally in some 190 plus countries to take the environmental movement forward. Uh, on 50th anniversary of the Earth Day last year, we have launched a campaign called My Future, My Voice that brings together young environmental leaders from across the globe together. And our aim really is to provide them with a platform uh, to not just share their trusted techniques of uh, restoring the earth, but also to build bridges and networks uh, across political borders and spaces, as you will see through these idea sessions which we are doing. And as we speak, we have 167 youth uh, leaders from 83 countries on six continents all together. And each leader, um, as you will see, Lynn is one of our youth ambassadors. They have a proven track record of substantive work done towards environmental con conservation. Um, ideas, which is basically inspiring dialogues for environmental action series, uh, this is the second series that we've started, is basically a presentation by My Future, My Voice Youth Ambassadors, uh, wherein each month we invite uh, successful and eminent individuals like Ashwika to share their experiences and lessons with our youth climate leaders. Uh, these sessions are moderated by a youth ambassador, and we hope that through these inspirational talks, all youth uh, get inspired and they gain knowledge to work on environmental issues in their countries and around the globe. Um, you will all agree that you know, climate educated and environmentally literate citizens are likely to be better placed to make uh, more sustainable and better consumer decisions uh, and to take educated choices that are really good for our planet, uh, which is why climate literacy is at the core of uh, what we do at EarthDay.org. What we've done this year is that our aim is really to transform climate education from a nice to have into a core sub subject for school curricula worldwide. Uh, and that's why our organization has launched a global campaign that calls upon all the governments to commit to urgent action on climate and environmental literacy at the COP26 in Glasgow this year. And I'm really happy for today's session since we have these two wonderful young women who are not just climate literate, as you will see, but also do wonderful work on the ground that enables them to inspire and motivate so many around us. Uh, so today is the second series of the ideas and I would like to extend my warm gratitude to our guest speaker who is a very well-known nature filmmaker, uh, wildlife TV presenter, green Oscar winner, Ashuta Kapoor from India and our EarthDay.org youth ambassador, Nankucha uh, Ochira, and Chai, I hope I've pronounced that correct. And uh, I would really love to call you just Lynn, as we lovingly call you, from Thailand will moderate this session. She's an environmental writer and founder of Climate Strike Movement in Thailand. And we'll shortly hear them speak on today's uh, topic on nature and storytelling and learn about their experiences and journey so far. They both are climate writers and storytellers in their own uh, beautiful ways. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. This will be an hour long webinar and we will have time for questions and answers in the end. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat box that is right, right uh, you know, down below. And uh, Lynn, uh, while moderating, will bring them up to our presenter. If you'd like to speak and ask, please raise your hands. If we do have time, we will try our best to have you asked directly as well. And for that, I'll request my colleague Tiki to do that, to give you access for that. Um, and now without any further ado, I would request our regional director, uh, Mrs. Karna Singh to share a few words. And before we turn it over to Ashwika and Lynn, uh, thank you everyone. And uh, we hope that you will be with us for the whole session today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nishtu. And I just wanted to say welcome to Ashwika, Lynn, and all those who have logged on here. I know it's going to be a riveting session. I have heard Ashwika speak before and I know how wonderful she is. I just wanted to point out two things. Nishu spoke about climate education, climate literacy, and the next step 
is to realize that all this can lead to fantastic jobs. So Ashwika's example is uh, very relevant for that. She has used her education to get into a field where she's not only recognized, uh, but she has been able to create a career out of it. So this is something that is a part of the green economy and I would urge everyone to look at that and understand that as we go into a post carbon era, uh, there are so many jobs that would be available. These are jobs that help us decarbonize the economy. These are jobs that help us protect the natural resources and grow them because now we have to be nature positive, not just restore, but beyond that, as the UN has just announced two days ago, that we need to be nature positive. These are jobs that deal with any form of pollution or waste management and beyond. So uh, all you people who are getting so well educated, look for these jobs, because these can make very strong careers for you something very different from my time when it would not make a good career for me. That time it was engineering, medicine, or, you know, things like that. The other thing I wanted to point out was the great power of storytelling. In fact, when Nishu, uh, not Nishu, sorry, when Ashvika won her award, the jury said that this category brought, I quote their words, this category brought hundreds of entries from 42 countries. But in the end, we chose her film, that means Ashvika's film, as it had all the hallmarks of a strong storyteller. So uh, you are fortunate today to hear from two storytellers and see how this method can be employed to awaken uh, environmental literacy in youth and others. Thank you so much, Nishu, and back to you. Thank you so much, Mom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karnaji. That was really well uh, spoken. I'll pass it over to Lynn to moderate today's talk and let them to speak. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nishu. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Lynn, and it's good to be here today and excited to be talking with Ashvika as well. Um, but before that, I'd like to introduce her um, because as this, this panel is, you know, there's its ideas, inspiring dialogues to, you know, environmental action series. And really there's one more than just one way to save our environment. So Ashrika Kapoor, um, she's a postgraduate in science communication and natural history filmmaking. And at age 27, Ashrika had the singular privilege of becoming India's youngest and only woman to win the Green Oscar or Panda Award in a global category. The Panda Awards are considered worldwide as the industry gold standard for wildlife and environment filmmakers. Ashwika was also selected as a finalist for USA's top na nature filmmaking award, the Grand Teton Award at the world-renowned ja Jackson Hole Wildlife Film Festival. Her films aren't just a documentation of nature, they're carefully structured narratives of conservation, scientifically told in a fresh, unique, and original way. Ashwika's career since 2014 has so far taken her across several countries. She's lived and worked in several parts of the world, including South Africa, Kenya, Borneo, New Zealand, UK, and of course, India. She has worked with companies like the BBC, CBBC, Netflix, Discovery Channel and Animal Planet, which I used to watch all the time when I was younger. Um, her latest projects include Attenborough's Life in Color, which I've also already watched. Um, and uh, it's on the BBC on and on Netflix and an international conservation children's series called Planet Defenders. And that she is uh, directing and producing for children's BBC. A Charles Wallace scholar to the United Kingdom, Ashwika's works are also often screened at various academic institutions, both in India and the UK, where she conducts talks on science and conservation storytelling. And so I'm done talking um, <laughs> for her now, and I'd love to welcome her and let her share more about herself. Thank so, you, Lynn. Thank you so much for that Ashwika. lovely introduction. <laughs> you can yeah, call please. me Ash. 
Okay, Ash. Everyone here can call me Ash, <laughs> so, just to break the ice. And mm -hmm. I've also read a lot about what you've been doing, and congratulations. Uh, you've been you've been such a fantastic youth leader for the for conservation and for climate change and everything. And uh, yeah. you've you've made you you're, you're obviously doing fantastic. You're doing really well. So that's amazing to be talking to you today. Likewise, I, I'm really and, happy yeah. because I've just been, you know, I, I usually do environmental writing, but lately for the past one or two years, I've been getting more into film and photography myself. So it's, it's a real, ah, real pleasure you know, to be speaking to you and learning more about what your process is. So really to, to begin, like where, where did, or how, <laughs> or when did this all begin with, with your filmmaker and with your passion for the environment? So, you know, Lynn, I always get that as the first question, always, because when I invariably tell people that, uh, you know, what you do, and I'm like, I'm a wildlife filmmaker, and then the first response is always like, really? How did that start? How did that happen? How did you choose that as a career? And I think the answer to that question, very oddly, I think it lies very deep in my childhood. Because uh, ever since I was very little, I was a tiny little girl, I've always had an instinctive and very natural and very sort of, inst uh, sort of you know, innate bond with animals. I've always connected to the animals very early on in life. And I grew up around a lot of animals, which was um, unusual because I grew up in the heart of a bustling Indian city. I grew up in Calcutta, which is essentially a complete concrete jungle if you look at it from above. Uh, but at the same time, I kind of seeked out nature and found my animal connections when I was young. And it began, oddly enough, when I was about four. So there's a cute little story attached to that. So I asked my mom for a dog when I was four, like, you know, all animal loving babies. Uh, I asked my mom for a dog. And my mother, of course, being the practical mother that she was, she pat came the reply. She said, nope, no dog. Sorry, we live in an apartment. Too difficult. Too much responsibility. You can't have a dog. I was four and at that time not very creative so the only other animal I knew with a d was a duck so I said okay if I can't have a dog can I have a duck for some very weird reason my mother thought that was a better idea so when I was four years old uh, all my friends used to take their dogs for a walk on a lead and I used to take my duck for a walk on a leash so that's how it began in fact I have a little picture of me when I was really tiny and um uh, uh, gosh, where is it? Be there somewhere with me walking with my famous duck in the middle of the city. So that's how it really. <laughs> that's how it all started. <laughs> and, yeah, and then you know, of course, I went on to make all kinds of other animal friends. I used to have a wild pigeon called Michael that used to greet me after school. That was when I was a little bit older. And then slowly I started bringing home all kinds of other animals. I used to have rabbits and guinea pigs, etc., and just turn my flat which was in the middle of a, a city into a what could only be described as a functional farm <laughs> and uh, only thing that was really missing was uh, well I was about eight years old when we went to North Bengal for a holiday and then I tried to bring home this this goat which was almost my size and <laughs> that's when my mother really drew the line and said no enough <laughs> no, she really regretted not getting me that dog so that's how life kind of began with a lot of animals and I've always had a second weakness which is for storytelling whether it was uh, a good book or a good film or even just my grandfather's very tall tales it didn't matter I had a real soft corner for storytelling so when I was older and had to decide what I wanted to do uh, I was already a student of literature, so storytelling was something that I had already studied in a, in a way because I was a student of literature. So I decided to put my two favorite things together, storytelling and animals, and use the camera as my medium. Uh, and I decided to be a wildlife filmmaker. Yeah. That sounds oh. very, you know, resembling. And in a way, for me, it wasn't really the animals, but more so the plants. Like, I, I love trees. And really? Like, oh, like, that's amazing. Yeah, that's together. lovely. Yeah, but so, you know, Aww. you started with, with dogs and with ducks and, and pigeons, but so <laughs> tell me, like, what, what kinds of other animals are there now? Like, what, what does an average day in your life as a wildlife photographer look like? It, you know, maybe your mom was scared that one day you'd bring home a tiger or something. So, like, well, she had no doubts at one point. She said, if you don't get her a dog, she <laughs> don't know what she's going to bring home next. So, um, well, yeah, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question because uh, the average day of a wildlife filmmaker, it, wildlife filmmaking sounds all glamorous on paper. I promise you, <laughs> most of the times it is an app, it is tough. So first of all, um, wild animals are mostly, mostly active very early in the day. 
So super early in the morning and of course, uh, early evening, in, you know, sort of sunlight, uh, sunrise and sunset is when they're most active. So uh, our best shots, our best chance of getting great behavior and our best shots are always really early in the morning. So you've got to be out there and set yourself up in a hide or in a car or up on a tree or wherever you plan to be. You've got to be there even before the sun rises. So the first for the first thing is that you've got to be okay with being a very, very early riser. And even when it's dark, you've got to head out. And uh, so early morning is when it all starts. And then um, of course, you've got to wait till all the way till evening because once the sun sets, only then do you come back. And then of course, through the day you've had, I mean, whatever you shot, et cetera, you've got to come back and back all that footage up. Mm. And sometimes where we say there's less electricity and you know all kinds of issues. So you've got to really spend a lot of time sort of backing stuff up and rebacking it up. There's a lot of technology involved, but you know, it's not the late sort of, uh, well, it's not the, the long days, which are uh, I mean, the late, late endings and the early starts, that's really not where the challenge lies. It's what's in between. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can tell you, frankly, that I've spent most of my career staring at grass. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, because literally nothing happens in the wild most of the times. It's just like literally, you just have to carry on waiting. So it's a lot of patience. And when I say waiting, I don't mean waiting with like your phone, because first of all, you probably don't have network. If you do, even then, you can't be doing that because you can't be distracted. It's not like you can have a book. It's not like you can distract yourself with music because you, what you're doing is in that time that you're waiting, you also have to be super alert because when something happens in the wild, it happens so quickly, it happens in such a flash that if you weren't alert during that wait, then all that wait is essentially goes to waste. So you've got to be super alert. And then of course comes the fact that, you know, sometimes you're sitting in a hide or sitting somewhere else and it's boiling, it's hot mm -hmm. as hell. And it's just, it's, you know, it's either it's like peak summer or it can be freezing cold, or you could be or you could be like getting eaten up by mosquitoes and insects. Or like recently I was filming in the Sundarbans and it was one of the hardest, hardest shoots I've done because for those who don't know what the Sundarbans is not very familiar with the ter terrain, it's a mangrove forest. So basically it's an intertidal zone, which means that the land that, I mean, the most of the land that we were filming and I was filming these tiny animals called mudskippers, which are uh, very cute. They are like little fish that live out of water. They're tiny, they're very adorable but they live in the mud. And I was literally submerged in mud for eight to 10 hours up to my waist every day. And I was practically solidified in that position <laughs> for 10 hours with pins and needles and mosquitoes and the heat and the saline environment. And I mean, this is just a glimpse of what my office space would normally look like. Hopefully I can find it again somewhere. Yeah, it's always been super interesting, you know, when you watch like a like a Planet Earth documentary and you're yeah. already fascinated by that, but then you watch that other side series that they have of the behind the scenes. Behind the scenes, <laughs> right? Yeah. More because it was just, how, how do you do that? That's the average day in office. Wow. <laughs> and that's what, you know, that's basically a very luxurious oh. lunch. And yes, yeah, so it's just hours, hours just sitting submerged in the mud like that. And this was on the second or third day where a very creative boat uh, driver suggested that I carry a chair in, which was very smart because then I could have the tripod in it. So yeah, so that's your average day in the wild. <laughs> it's anything but glamorous. So it's do quite you usually work, work with a team or with uh, someone else or do you usually go alone? Or? It depends on the scale of the shoot. Mm -hmm. So say the shoot is for something really big, then sometimes you have like your, you have the luxury of two or three other people. Sometimes you're making films for smaller, um, for more, say sort of uh, small organizations for conservation, purely for conservation, not so much for the bigger channels and for entertainment. And then of course, because your budgets are down, it's lesser, but regardless of how, how, many as in you know three or four whatever regardless how many people there are in the wild you're mostly on your own because you can't actually have a band of people around you because you know you'd be disturbing that so even if we have one or two other people with us we are normally split up or we're doing se separate cameras or somebody else is doing sound separately but it's split up so a lot of the times you are um on your own but that's the fun part for me i mean i'm alone in nature but i never feel lonely because i'm just I don't know. I just absolutely love being out there. So, yeah. 
And uh, what kinds of animals have you seen so far? What kinds of plants that you've seen that have really, really struck you? And maybe, maybe if you have a few images that you've taken of, of these, uh, this wildlife. Yeah, show. that's. There's lots of images um, I can show you. I can, uh, there are a couple of films. I can show you little clips of it if you want. Um, there's loads of, I mean, I filmed uh, every, like, obviously there's so much left to film, but I've also filmed everything from like sort of tiny, like I said, little mud skippers and frogs all the way to snow leopards. And uh, so there's been a variety of stuff that I've had the privilege of sort of uh, uh, filming and being in their environment. Um, among them, I think a couple of couple of species really stand out as highlights from my career. Uh, one would be the Kakapo, or the film that we were talking about a little while ago, the one that won, that was my first big film actually. It was the one that won the Green Oscar. It was on a species called the Kakapo. Lynn, do you know what the Kakapo is? No, tell me about it. <laughs> the Kakapo is <laughs> amazing. So it's like this three kilo parrot. Um, which doesn't fly. It's a flightless three kilo parrot that looks less like a parrot and more like a teddy bear. And they're super <laughs> rare. They're super rare. And they live all live in this one island off the, off the coast of New Zealand in, in the Pacific Ocean. And there's only a few years ago when I was filming them, there was only like 125 of them. I think now there must be a little bit more, but they're very, very endangered. They're like literally a dwindling tiny population. And they're a completely prehistoric species and they're absolutely adorable. So I was finishing my uh, post-graduation in science communication in New Zealand. And as part of my degree, I had to make a film. So I chose to do the Kakapo. And while researching that story, I came across a really strange bit of information. I realized that amongst these 125 Kakapo parrots, there was one amongst them that didn't think it was a parrot at all. He thought he was a human being. So he was a really funny character called Sirocco, and they've named all the parrots because there's so few of them, they've actually named them all conservationists. So this one's name was Sirocco, and he was convinced he was a person. He didn't want to hang out with the other kakapos at all. He just wanted to hang out with people. And he's actually so funny that one thing sort of led to another, and he's such a character that he soon shot to absolute stardom in New Zealand and became this absolute celebrity bird. And the government of New Zealand noticed this rising celebrity status of his on the internet and gave him a job. So Sirocco today, <laughs> I'm not even making this up. You couldn't make it up. So Sirocco today is the world's only bird with a government job. And wow. so I made a yeah, so I made a film about Sirocco's life and how he went from being, uh, well, from Dutch to start, as my film is called, how he went from really like sort of it's an Oliver Twist story, it's rags to riches, how he went from being like a, from modest beginnings to superstardom. It's a story about his life. I'll show you the, a little clip from the, from the film. I'm curious myself and someone's just asked, what is his government job? And he's also, the official, is, is this... he's a official Sorry, ambassador. Um, official <laughs> ambassador for conservation. Oh, wow. Is, is yes. this, by the way, is a kakapo like this bird that's black and it's got a really big orange beak? Or we'll see in jealous? a minute. I'll show okay. you in a minute. <laughs> wow. Hang on. Can you see? Do you confirm uh, if you can? We can see your screen, but the, the video is not showing. No, it'll show in a sec. Tell me if you can see it. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Where can we watch this in the meantime? Is, is there a place that you've posted it or? I think it's online now because the New York Film Festival Division has put it online. New Zealand, mm. 2013. A celebrity has just arrived. <laughs> oh yeah, I heard he's coming to Dunedin. That's pretty cool though. Yeah, I'm a fan. I follow him on Facebook and I get all his tweets on Twitter. It was a pleasure having the ambassador on board. So did you work on this film with a team? And he's an important member of the government. Pretty cool. You don't often meet a celebrity like him. We're just making sure that everything is absolutely first class and the airport is safe and secure to allow the VIP entry and exit as smoothly as possible. The ambassador is chauffeur driven. It's a 60 minute drive to his five star high security accommodation where he can finally drop his guard. Oh, Meet what? His Excellency. Not human. <gasps> That's crazy. 
Sirocco is a very rare bird, a kākāpō. It's a privilege to see him in broad daylight because he's nocturnal. His flight is moved. <laughs> so Oops. Wow. That's, that's really great. I love the introduction as well. Just one second. Still hear it. I don't know why. Can you still hear it? No, it's, it's gone now. Well, I can. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. amazing. So like, did, did you work? Did you work on that for like, how long did it take you to say the entire process? go through one film. I, not not long in terms of production because hmm. he was such he's so protected <laughs> it was like trying to film an actual celebrity because it was like I have to take an appointment for these dates I have to film him on these dates and you know I had to be really sort of like it, it was all very regimentally sort of planned it was like actually he's precious to the country hmm. so um the shoot itself wasn't for very very long uh, probably a couple of weeks uh, at most, but the, I, a lot of research went into it because mm. that's something that uh, is that's very a crucial. Huge part. Yes, it's a very huge part. It actually prepares you really well to be able to tell the story in the right way. You have to know your subject very, very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so uh, I guess you know you, your your work is, in a way, we you do film, I do writing. Our, our work is you know these animals, plants, wildlife they don't really speak the same language that we do. And, and it feels kind of almost like our duty to, to speak up for them and tell Absolutely. their stories. Absolutely. And for example, like Sirocco, you know, like who do you think should be telling stories of Sirocco? Is it, is, is it Sirocco telling the story himself? <laughs> or like, should it, the task that would be left to experts like advocates or, or scientists or filmmakers or journalists? Or do you think anyone can can tell these really impactful environmental stories? Well, it, it depends. If it, if it, if you're an environmentalist, if you're a zoologist, if you're a conservationist, anybody, if you're a scientist and you have an inclination for storytelling and you want to do it, there's nothing like it. There are many conservationists who are very busy in their work in the sense that they're more involved in the actual sort of groundwork and they'd rather have somebody else tell the story for them. That's when we step in. But then again, I know a lot of scientists and I know a lot of conservationists who are very good at doing, doing that storytelling for themselves. I know a lot of civilians who are just, you know, who are able to do that themselves. So I think anybody can be a storyteller if they want to. It's just a matter of whether you want to be doing it. Like I'd love to be doing ground level conservation work actually, but then I, I do storytelling and that's my contribution to, co contribution to conservation. But it's not like I couldn't be doing the other stuff if I wanted to. So it just depends on whether or not you choose to do it. And I don't think that there is a hard and fast rule in terms of whether you leave it to us or whether you want to do it yourself. It's just about gathering those skills. And if you have those skills and you're ready to sort of nurture those skills, anybody can be a storyteller. And we are very good storyteller at that. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I definitely agree. It's, I mean, in, in a way it is in our human nature, you know, to tell stories. That's how we've, yeah. we've learned everything from our parents, from our ancestors, and even our, in our everyday communication, speaking with each other, telling each other things and yeah. sharing. Um, but so, you know, I guess there are some ways to, to tell it better than others, some ways to make people laugh more, cry more. And, you know, what you say about how a lot of citizens, you know, regardless of what they do, are becoming more like storytellers now, I think is also a lot of social media involved, a lot more like technology is, is so much more accessible now as well. Absolutely. As, as so everybody channels. has that, doesn't it? Exactly. Everyone's got a camera. Everyone's yeah. got that, a platform and an audience. So there you go. All you have to do after that is sort of hone your skills. Yeah. But what's so like say I have a phone and I, I don't really, I want to tell a story, but I don't really know what's the best way. I, I really love nature. What would you say are some of the best storytelling tell tactics I can use, you know, whether it's in the narrative or in the visual aesthetics? Um, what, what is the best way to, that you've found most effective to inspire people or educate people or, or encourage people to, to do more for the environment and, and for the climate? Well, I think first of all, one of the main, like without, okay, let's put it this way, a story most importantly runs, basically it's, its foundation is its characters, right? 
So the first thing you've got to do with a great story is find your character, whether that is a human character that you found who's sort of on a journey to be doing something for nature, or whether that's actually an animal character like the way I found. You've got to turn your, you've got to turn your, uh, the, the, whatever you turn the camera on is your hero. And it's that hero's journey that you're going to be following. And that's the thing about storytelling. It, it allows you to sort of speak, sort of, sort of start speaking to an audience outside that echo chamber of people who are already engaged in conservation or interested in the environment. Storytelling brings in those people who are not naturally well inclined to be, sort of knowing or wanting to know about the environment. So what storytelling does is brings in that bunch of people who are not there so much for the fact that, you know, there's, there's, you know, species are dying out or, cons or you know, climate change. They are there because they're there to, they want to hear a great story. And it just so happens that your story is engaging them, is making them love something. And when you love something, you automatically want to protect it. So that's where really, the, that's where the power of storytelling is. And that's something to always keep in mind when you're making a story. It's like, first of all, assume nobody cares. I know it's a bad way to sort of put it, but my point is, it's like, why should anybody care about what I want to tell them? Why should anybody care that, you know, these animals are dying out? As soon as you assume that people don't actually come with that uh, sort of uh, preconceived sort of, uh, sort of, the biggest problem is indifference, right? If you, if you assume that your audience is going to be indifferent to the subject, then you're going to find a way to engage them. And the moment you do that, you're sort of changing the, you're changing the whole game isn't it? So that's the most important thing, really, is when you look at something and you want to tell this really important story, that's in your backyard, right? It's just in your backyard, but you want to tell this really important story in your backyard. you got to think, okay, let's get, how do I engage somebody who's not interested in nature? How is it going to engage that person? How is it going to engage those people? How is it going to engage my parents or, you know, my neighbors or like, you know, regular people? It's not just about making it for those that yeah. that already are uh, already are on your side, if you know what yeah. I mean. So yeah, it's not like preaching to the choir. You don't want to absolutely. You don't want to preach to the choir, right? Yeah, and and I feel like as as storytellers, you know, our our job essentially is to be teachers, right? Yeah. To we we when we want to create change, we're not going to create change by talking to someone and repeating the same things that they already know about and just having them agree with us. That's not what we want. Yeah. And with teachers, also they're not trying to teach things to someone who already knows the exact same things they're trying to teach, right? Um, so how would you say that could be adapted to say teachers in a in a more specific sense in the, in the classroom? You know, like. And whether it's it's in, in high school and or in kindergarten, what do you how how do you think they can adapt storytelling into their their own classrooms? Well, to be honest, Lynn, if you look back at school life, right? I mean, you, the best teachers were the best storytellers. They mm -hmm. made classes into performances, didn't they? They 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 taught like they were story. They were performers. They were storytellers, weren't they? So anyway, the best teachers tell you know say it like a story. Now, when it comes to teachers, I think the most important thing really is, is they need like, there's a generation of older teachers that, that need to sort of keep up almost with the young generation because the younger generation are so into the environment and just so into climate change, just so into uh, sort of wildlife and nature. And there seems to be, to be really, you know, to be really frank, there seems to be a bit of a gap sometimes between what's being taught as a theory in classrooms and what students really want to be engaged in. So I think just to keep ourselves sort of abreast to sort of keep ourselves updated, it's so important for teachers to even like so go out and just be students themselves, to just sort of learn as much as they can about the things that are happening in the world. Insert, insert nature, insert environment, insert the you know stories about the planet, uh, anecdotes about what's going on, on the, in the planet into their teaching, no matter what, that teaching may be into the classroom. And be the best teachers are also the most inspiring. And before you know it, you might have, God knows, you might change, you might shape, you might inspire 10 minds in your class, which are going to, who are going to grow up to choose a green career, who are going to grow up and actually pick a career that's going to make a difference to the planet. So I mm -hmm. think if every teacher, I mean, this is idealistic thinking, but if every teacher took that pledge to, to sort of insert the environment in one way or another into their classes 
and make it fun and make it engaging and make it something that the kids look forward to, then just imagine what you have in 10 years. You have a whole generation of very, very sort of uh, motivated young people. So I think, yes, definitely. I, I think uh, environmental uh, studies needs to be less about the book and less mm -hmm. about something that's sort of academic and like, oh my God, data and more inspiring because this is our planet we're talking about. This is our home we're talking about. There is no planet B. This is beautiful wildlife. This is nature. I mean, it's so easy to make it inspiring. So yeah, it definitely needs to be part of the classroom. And as a, both a teacher and also a student of, of nature yourself, you know, who's, who's both told stories and, and heard stories about all these wonderful animals and plants and also humans <laughs> what what have you learned from it and and in when it comes to climate change like what yeah. have you learned about the impacts that it has on on wildlife and also on us gosh i could carry on about that honestly because you know a lot of people think that so the thing is with climate change a lot of people think that it's just a big in, intangible mm -hmm. notion right it just feels so big and feels like such a I mean it's all it's it's daunting because you can't draw a sort of grasp it or in your head you can't quite see it you know what's happening right but then you know there are certain places that I've been to in nature there's certain experiences I've had where I've literally seen the effects of climate change right in front of my eyes mm -hmm. and one of the examples of that was a couple of years ago I was um I was in the Andamans and uh Ironically, I'm a, I'm, I, I love swimming. I'm a total water baby, but I've never dived until two years ago. And uh, only two years ago, I learned how to dive with the forest department for a film that I was doing for the Discovery Channel. And they were teaching me how to dive. And I was super excited because I was like, oh my God, I'm going to go underwater and there's going to be this coral reef, which is going to be like busting with colors. It's going to be the surfeit of colors. It's going to be this the land of Nemo and Dory and it's going to be great. And I was really looking forward to it. And I was so excited. So once I, my training was sort of a little uh, ahead, they said, okay, today you get to go underwater. And I was just like, wow, that's amazing. I was just looking forward. And I dived and... If I could cry underwater, I would, because I realized that I had dived in a coral reef that was just like a bleached white graveyard for miles. And all I saw underwater was just ghostly white. And that day for me hit home so badly because despite knowing everything, I mean, like, you know, despite knowing so much about climate change in theory, reading about it, hearing about it in my industry, talking to conservationists, that day I saw it in front of me and I just couldn't believe what we were doing to our planet. I mean, later, of course, I dived in a much more beautiful place how coral, and I saw the coral reef as it was meant to be. But my first dive in life was in a completely bleached coral reef. And one may think, how is that going to affect me sitting in Bangkok or Delhi? or New York, it's not gonna bother me because it's happening somewhere else, but it's not, right? Because the planet, it's just like they say, it's a small world. <laughs> Everything is connected. That is what they call the web of life. Every single thing is connected. It's like dominoes. If the oceans die, then things that depend on the ocean die. And then, you know, that affects us. And one thing leads to another. And climate change, the effects of it is just so tangible, especially in a place that like mine, where I live, which is in, in Calcutta, which is just off the coast of Bay of Bengal, where in the last three years, I mean, Nishu and um, uh, uh, Karana Mam would both know that we've had three of the greatest cyclones coming in the last three years. It's been frightful. And the frequency of cyclones have gone up all because of the of global warming. And there's a huge number of people that stay on the coast that are really badly off because of that. And there's going to be in the future, I, it's just inevitable that there's going to be mass absolutely mass uh, climate refugees and where are they going to go so there's just there's just so many implications to climate change and there's just so many effects that you can actually see if you go beyond the comfort of your home and just go and explore a little bit outside and you'll know that it is very very much knocking on our door step it's not something that's happening somewhere far away it's something that's happening right outside your doorstep really yeah, as a, as a climate activist, like I really do relate to just how how depressing that can get sometimes. 
yeah um, if not all the time you know living in this kind of reality where um, especially if you're you're on social media a lot or if you you read a lot about climate news and there's just constant constant bad news yeah. but <laughs> there's, there's no always... point in fretting <laughs> no but we have to we can't afford to lose exactly the we, you can't we, because we... then you give up the battle right exactly exactly but yeah. so so you know there's there's all this this entire world to fear but there's there's always that to me you know when I uh, it just it, it just drives me down so much but when I get back out there and go on a hike and then I climb to the mountain top and I just like look out it's like wow it's worth the you fight know? isn't it wow just this, this, this it's so worth is, the fight yeah if, if there's only this piece of forest left like that's worth fighting for so like Absolutely. Can, tell me like what, what was the good news is your... that the next generation very much feels that way mm -hmm. the youth very much feels that way and it's not going to be long before and they're already they, people are having to listen to them because there's just such a collection of voices already and they, they are not before long that they become adults i mean today greta is already an adult and so and then they have their voice and they have their vote so it's it's just a matter of keeping that, not losing that faith and sort of keeping that motivation going and not giving up. Just don't, just stick with it. And when you stick with something, somehow some magic happens and there will be a change. And you really have to believe that. And just, even if it's really, really hard, just carry on doing your part. Don't think about whether or not it's having an effect in the larger picture, because if everybody did that, then everyone's gonna get overwhelmed. Just do your part and somehow you feel like so many people doing their part, something is going to come together. Yeah. So as, as a filmmaker, you know, you've already described what was, what's been really depressing, but now with that we're talking about hope, like what yeah. scene or that, what scene have you either seen? Have yeah. you you've either watched or created yourself? That's just been the most inspiring thing that you can remember. <laughs> Okay, let me tell you a little, little anecdote and show you something that goes with it. It's going to be really mm -hmm. fun. So a few years ago, I was, this is actually one of my most fun experiences out there. And I think one of the most beautiful experiences of how, how, out in nature. Um, so a few years ago, uh, I was backpacking uh, in the northeast of India because I was looking for story ideas, you know, as you do as a budding wildlife filmmaker, you go off exploring <laughs> for stories. And I was in the northeast of India, which is a very unexplored part of the country. And I was searching for ideas and I sort of wandered in and found myself in this beautiful village uh, in the north, uh, in the in upper Assam, almost to the border of Myanmar, uh, Burma. And um, uh, this tiny little village was just sort of like tucked away and it was a, a tribal village and I sort of found my way there. And uh, I realized that that particular village had a gibbon living there. Do you know what a gibbon is? Mm -hmm. It's India's only ape species. It's an ape species. And uh, you have them in, in Thailand as well, right? So we have the Western Hula gibbons here. And there was one gibbon living there. And um, well, there was an interesting story behind that gibbon. She was actually, weirdly enough, the last gibbon in that region. Because all the other gibbons had either died because of like habitat loss in time. And that was the last family left. Or they had died because of hunting. They had got hunted. And she had a partner. Uh, this one female gibbon had a partner and a kid and both got hunted. And eventually what happened was she was the last gibbon in that region. Now, gibbons are really social animals. Like all ape species, gibbons are really social animals. So they can't really exist solitarily like that. So in time, she sort of started mustering up the courage to adopt, lo and behold, a human family to be her own. So she was a wild gibbon that actually adopted this beautiful tribal family to be her own and she made best friends she was best friends with this tribal man old man she befriended him and she was wild and she'd come she'd come every day to just hang out with him and groom him and when I was there I was totally not expecting this and I didn't know and when I walked in she was just hanging out and I was just like trying to film etc so she came really low down on the trees actually sat on my camera and started for looking for nits in my hair <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is mad. So let me just show you a little bit of a, a, a film. For this was for Discovery. In fact, you can find the link on YouTube. It's called, uh, if you Google adorable ape shares a relationship with people, if you just go, if you put that into uh, uh, YouTube, you should find it. It has, it's, it's hit millions of views over the last two years because it's just such, one, such a heartwarming story. And um, I was the first one to find that story and film it after that. 
uh, for discovery. And I'll show you a little bit from that film that I made. Can you see? Yes. This is Kalia. Can you hear when I do that? Yeah. Could you you could hear it? Okay, great. Yes. This is Kalia. She's a Western Hulak gibbon, one of the rarest apes in the world. Kalia lives in a forest in northeastern India. Local people say they used to see her with a mate and her offspring. What happened to them? No one knows. Now Kalia is alone. Except she isn't. has a friend, a man named Ningda. It was he who gave her her name. She lives wild in the trees around his house, but she's always close by. It's not about food, it's about the company. Gibbons are highly social animals and spend hours grooming, touching, and communicating. So in the absence of other apes, it seems Kalia's turned to her human neighbor. <laughs> Most days she visits for an hour or two, interacting with Ningda, grooming him and making his space her own. In short, Ningda's family are surrogate apes. And when visitors come calling, she inspects and grooms them as if she's head of the household. <laughs> this is really like an exotic ape, Muslim. Yep. And that includes our film crew. Clarify that this is a wild gibbon. She lives free. She doesn't. She's not a pet. She just happens to come to this house because she's got habituated to this place. And well, she loves people clearly, and people are her family. And she also seems to be finding all kinds of things in my hair, which is slightly worrying. <laughs> she's using three limbs. <laughs> this touch. So talking about inspiring, it's things like that that happen out in the wild that sort of, you know, just, I mean, it's just magical. And I spent so many days with Kalia. I just got to know her so well. And I returned the favor. I groomed her for many hours and she was very, very thankful. And, uh, and before anybody decides to ask that in the chat, no, she did not find any nits in my hair. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, so that's kind of stuff that, you know, yeah, but you know, every story that I tell, to be really honest, I mean, I don't want to make it, I, I mean, there's a motivation behind it. It's not just about, I mean, of course, it might have started out as a dream that I was following. I wanted to be out in nature. I wanted to be with animals, all of those things. But in time, what I do has gained a much greater sort of meaning and a purpose and a cause, because every story I tell has a cause behind it, even with Gibbons. Um, 
there's just there's just such widespread habitat loss now that they are imprisoned in these islands of forests that are all over northeast india and one island of forest to another island of forest has got all kinds of like things in between it's got like villages and towns and cities and there's no way that they can meet so you know these populations are crashing within those little protected islands and the more they're coming closer to sort of human beings they get endangered by things like electricity and such a beautiful species most people don't even know this is india's only ape species and such a beautiful species is its its future is hanging in the balance so you know it's not just about my going out there and having an adventure and sort of living my dream it's also a responsibility that automatically i shoulder with every film that i choose to make it is a responsibility i shoulder that i will hopefully inspire a number of people or encourage a number of people to sort of and put the spotlight on something that perhaps hasn't been in the spotlight before so yeah it's really really inspiring and then you know thank you for all that you do it's we we need that you know and and so this is just my last question and we're going to move on to some questions from from yeah, uh, for sure. everyone who's watching um what is what would at what advice would you give to whether me or or the younger generations or everyone who's aspired um to be filmmakers or or nature storytellers see the first advice that i'm going to give you is it's going to be really hard and if you take that for granted like oh my god this is going to be a really tough career and you're going to take that for granted and make your peace with it first <laughs> so once you made your peace with that then you won't quit because what happens from what i see is a lot of people go into green want to get into green careers but it's because it's just such a hard and sort of a sort of uphill climb if i may say then you know people just don't stick with it and the and actually the magic lies in sticking with it and i can say that after a few years in the beginning it was really hard because just imagine as a young indian girl walking around saying that hi i am a wildlife filmmaker people are like yeah okay right <laughs> whatever so <laughs> they don't take you very seriously but you have to stick with it and in time your work will speak for itself again coming back to because we're talking about climate change coming back to greta two big tails tiny girls standing there in the cold just holding a placard look where she is it's just a matter of not giving you know two hoots about what people are saying or whether it's hard it's a matter of just being determined and sticking with it so no matter if if this is something that you want to be doing you have to tell yourself that the first number of years are going to be very very hard it still is very hard for me and but you've got to stick with it and uh, so the moment you do that there comes a point where your voice will automatically start getting heard and you will start making a difference um second advice i'd give really is that look as far as green jobs are concerned of course there are certain jobs that are green in themselves like in the sense you would go into that particular job because it's a green job like conservation etc but then in a if you look at it in a different way uh whether it is film making or anything else any job can be made green when i mean that when i say that for example you could be really talented in debating and something you want to be a lawyer and that's what you want to do but you could be giving some amount of your time to for environmental law for helping out organizations that need to fight out for fight for the planet you could be a teacher you could be teaching maths for all i care but you could still be inserting uh, you know the environment into your lectures you could be inspiring students right out there it doesn't matter what job you're in in what politics oh my god i wish more people were in politics were inclined towards natural world right you want to be a politician fabulous i wish that regular jobs the, the ones that sort of take up mainstream regular jobs you can insert the environment into no matter what you do you can play a part in being in making a positive effect on nature and if you remember that then that's all it really takes because then each of us has a role to play and if you are in a position of power then you may not necessarily take up a job that is already a green job you might take up something else but in your position of power you have all the you have all the authority to make a difference and uh, you know have the right impact so just keep that in mind just keep nature yeah. just keep environment in mind no matter what you're doing and so for um this is a question from from the audience but so who yeah. was your inspiration to become a an environmental filmmaker 
a cliche is a cliche is for a reason. <laughs> I think my greatest hero is uh, obviously Sir David Attenborough. I grew up watching his films and uh, oh gosh, he's just such a, he's just amazing. And a few years ago, if you don't mind me sharing this, a few years ago, I actually had the chance to work with him um, uh, for the first time. And then I had a second chance, uh, but I met him a few years ago in England during a shoot in that stuff. And a lot of people say, you know, don't meet your heroes and uh, they say, you know, it's going to be different from what you imagine. But uh, on the contrary, it was the most inspiring, beautiful experience of my life because he is just as you imagine him. He is so inspiring. His his enthusiasm for the natural world and for animals is just so contagious. And, and the most amazing thing, he's such a legend. Like he's whole of, I mean, there's just, just millions of people who love him. And he's such a legend. But at the end of the day, he's just such a regular person as well. He's got a great sense of humor. And he's so encouraging and so motivating. And it was just amazing meeting him. So he's actually my absolute hero. Mm -hmm. And that's, you, you know, you, you probably spoke English with him. And so another question from the audience is, if we humans have a common language like English, but do plants and animals uh, on all wildlife, do they have a common language that they use to speak with each other too? Do you have any idea? <laughs> Animal communication is a really interesting, interesting field to actually mm -hmm. research because I think within an environment, even though, I mean, it's a funny thing to say, but even though, like, for example, um, a, a tiger recognizes uh, sort of, uh, sorry, a bird or a monkey recognizes an alarm call from a different species where, and a different species recognizes an alarm call from another species when there's a predator going around, right? So in a given environment, even though a frog sounds different from a bird, sounds different from like a monkey, everything sort of understands each other's language in a weird way, right? So that's what, it's just how I feel. I think that's exactly how animal communication works within an environment. And even though they're sounding different to us, I think they've learned to sort of understand the different calls because they, they exist within that same sort of uh, space and environment. So uh, they look out for each other and uh, yeah, that's, that's, what really how nature works and uh, yeah it's it's wonderful, it's wonderful. yeah <laughs> there's harmony in nature isn't there yeah it's a beautiful yeah. thing speaking about harmony there's another question this one's about hybrids <laughs> so the question is there's um ligers and and tigans right um and I don't know. So, <laughs> so can I, I keep getting mixed up. Which one is which? Yeah. I know that I, I keep getting mixed up. <laughs> so can yeah. can we produce fertile offspring from them to raise the their population to save? But why? <laughs> I, it's, it's like okay no i hope they don't it's gonna be really weird right. i mean That's see these are just answer. artificial yeah. yeah yeah i just find it really weird. i mean it's okay it's like this odd thing that you know somewhere whatever people just do strange things they engineer it's strange okay things it happens in nature you know if, if they it won't happen, happen in nature yeah, That's exactly that. it's, but it's, if, it's, if we're trying yeah. to make it happen then if it happens in nature i'll be there to film it for sure <laughs> At least I want to be. No, but I mean, yeah, it's not natural. It's not natural. It's just something that we get a kick out of. Oh, half a lion, half tiger, whatever. It's just something that we do for the kicks because we can. And I think it's just it, it's just one of those strange things that <laughs> human beings get a kick out of. I don't know. I just don't agree with it very much. And I find it weird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank but, you, yeah. Ashwika. So that puts a wrap to our, our dialogue. It was really, really yeah. great with you and just learned so much today can't wait to see more of your stuff stuff, uh, stuff coming out um yeah and just, thank you thank you so much i had a great time thank you so much thank you so much ashwika and lynn and uh, it was wonderful to hear you both speak uh, i think we've answered most of the questions so we will call it a wrap but before that um, i would like to re-emphasize that you know earth is also a very important reminder uh, that we need to, to take care of our planet Earth. And as you will all know, uh, David uh, Dennis Hayes, when he started the first Earth Day, um, he was a very young person. And Ashwika, as you mentioned, he's still young. Son, you know, he's still young yeah, at heart. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he, he's got more energy than I do. I'm telling you, he's got more energy than I do. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so yeah, I, I think you made a very important point about uh, you know having green jobs as part of all the jobs that we do and I think yeah. that's a very really a very important key takeaway 
and something that we say, you know, in our global theme, which is the Sierra Store at Earth, that um, you know, every, anything you do can become a green job uh, and we can think from a green mindset. So thank you so much, Ashwika. It was really an inspirational talk and thank you so much, Lynn. Thank you for uh, inviting for me. Excellently moderating. Excellently yeah, moderating. Lynn, I had a great time. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having Brilliant. me. So, Karnaji, any last words? Before I just wanted that? to mention that, you know, not everyone have a, has a DLX camera and all that, but use your mobile phone. Wow. And we have uh, an initiative that's called Citizen Scientist, where you can use your mobile phone to, you know, even photograph the bee, which is such an important thing, which people don't even realize is dying out. And yet it has such an important role to play in pollination. So use your camera, uh, use the app. It's the Citizen Scientist app that we have. And uh, yeah, that's amazing. Absolutely, ma'am. I totally agree. Everybody's a, everybody has the technology now. So yeah. absolutely. Backyard stories with exactly whatever technology you have with you. Absolutely. And you get connected to the rest of the world. You know that yeah. you like this here. Uh, has it been spotted somewhere else in India or somewhere else in Asia or somewhere else in the world and uh, what's its population and also maybe an issue uh, we can send them if anyone's interested the link to that and they can use it and get connected we don't have to wait for scientists in their laboratories to do it you can be one yeah thank you Thank you, thank you, both of you. you were excellent. So, thank you so much. I just flew. Thank you very much. Thank, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank Take you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.